Like, this is one of the big matches, the matchups of the format, and one that I've always thought was really interesting, especially in, like, how... It, we'll get to the postboard part later. That's the yeah. part that I really like about this matchup. Me too. Um, game one, it's hard on Shane's side, right? He's playing a creature deck, whereas creatures just don't have big numbers on them very easily, very much, and he's pretty soft to Supreme Verdict. Yeah. And, and that is basically the, the turning point for this matchup, right, is like whether or not the blue-white deck has Supreme Verdict on turn four. Uh, we saw Mono Blue Devotion do a little bit better against blue-white control decks once they made this shift to Planar Cleansing instead of Detention Sphere, but I think most people are solidly back in the Detention Sphere camp. Uh, so that, that kind of just like shifts things back in the blue-white deck's favor. So uh, Ellen's got a little bit of Red Splash, which might not help him here. Like his, his uh, mana base is a little more inconsistent. Uh, and it, it doesn't really have a lot of the cards that you want in this matchup. Yeah. yeah, so when you look at the cards he's chosen to play red for, he is playing three Is It Charm, two Mizium Mortars, and a Karanos God of the Storm. Other than that, he's a straight blue-white deck. He's made room for that by cutting a little bit of the staples of blue-white. He's shaved an Azorius Charm. He's cut down on a Jace. Um, outside of that, he's not playing any uh, no quickens, no divinations. So like that secondary yep. card drawer that you normally see is not in the deck. Yeah, I think he's just using Isachar mostly for the filtering instead of like divination for hard card advantage. Yeah, which is actually, I don't think would give him some extra game here. Um, because Isich, like divination is a card that I oftentimes find I don't have time to cast against mono blue, but Isachar yep. is something I'd be pretty happy to draw. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's certainly pretty reasonable. Yeah, so match, still waiting for the match to start. Allen mulligan to six, but he capped Shane is currently on a five-card hand. Yeah, and it looked like his six-card hand was all islands. Was six islands? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's close, but I don't think he can... <laughs> don't think you can keep that one. Um, I don't know, a lot of people say that that's the best card in Magic, so... Island, so why not have six of them? Right. It's, it's six times the best card. It's pretty hard to beat that hand. Yeah. But, uh, so, but yeah, game one, the blue, mono blue deck plays like a fairly traditional aggro deck here. You know, it's it's playing guys on curve and hoping to kill you with them. Yep, exactly. And something like Thassa is going to be really big. Uh, maybe like a follow-up Master of Waves after a Supreme Verdict. And the card that I think he really wants in this matchup is Biden of Thassa, which does not seem to be in his deck. Yeah, there are about seven, six or seven spots you can work with in the mono blue. You generally, there's eight, yeah, there's seven spots. And what he's chosen to play is three rapids, two cyclonic rifts, and for two domestication. So he's not playing like a 29th creature or a Bident or a Hall of Triumph or anything like yeah. that. Uh, Alan was on the play. He's starting off on a Temple of Triumph and just another tap land. This is Hallowed Fountain. There is a one drop for Shane. It's Judge's Familiar. His follow-up to that, though, is a little lacking. He does have a Cyclonic Rift and a Night Veil Spectre in his hand. But a well-placed kill spell, or even like an Azorius Charm out of Alan, right now will blunt most of the attacks that Shane could have. Yeah, it's certainly going to give him a lot of time, especially after Shane had to mulligan to five. Uh, so we're talking a lot about this matchup hinges on whether or not the blue-white deck has Supreme Verdict or not. But when Shane mulls to five and doesn't have a very fast clock, Alan doesn't even really need the Supreme Verdict, you know? Like, he's in no rush. Yeah, and I think one of the difficulties here in this matchup is Mono Blue is a lot about, like, the synergy in the deck. So Mono Blue, like, its best shot game one is to be play like a traditional aggro deck, you know? It still has trouble with Verdict. It still loses to Revelation for four. So... But where I think it becomes difficult for Mono Blue is that his one drops cost one, like, instead of his one drops being a two one for one, they're a one one for one. And his three drop only has two power. Right. Whereas, as opposed, you know, other decks have four power two drops. So it's just like, he's doing a very bad impression of an honest aggro deck. Yeah. You see Supreme Verdict there cleared away the Night Veil and the Judge's Familiar. Shane replaced with a Frostburn Weird, but is nearly out of cards. You see Alan just continuing to make lands, scrying one. It's like, Alan is not under enough pressure that he's forced to do anything here. Yeah, I mean, he certainly has plenty of time to set up to do whatever he wants to do. Uh, he even has an Is It Charm in case, like, Shane wants to get really aggressive with his Frostburn Weird, which... He probably has to. Yeah. He, otherwise, he just has a two-power guy. It's not yeah, good enough. Yeah, I mean, enough. he just drew a, a Night Veil Spectre, so maybe he just pumps it twice, which is what it looks like. Yeah, he pumps but. it. He pumps it twice. That's up to a 3-2. Alan's not going to go for the Izzet Charm. He's actually going to hold it up, willing to take three damage here. And here comes Night Veil. Alan, I think, feeling so... Had a dissolve in his hand and was feeling confident enough there that 
he just wanted to leave up his dissolve as opposed to trying to kill the Frostburn Weird. Yeah, and, and chances are the is it Charm can actually still kill the Frostburn Weird next turn. I imagine Shane, if Shane is willing to pump it to a 3-2 last turn, he'll probably do it again this turn. And we do see Alan in his hand does have the Sphinx's Revelation already, so he's really just trying to stay alive, and at 13 life doesn't feel too much pressure. Yep. Master of Waves, though, was the draw for Shane. With the Supreme Verdict and Dissolve both gone from Alan's hand, it's possible he does not have an answer to Master of Waves just yet. Yeah, it is entirely possible. So, you see, one pump from Shane, and then presumably yeah, Master of Waves for three. And then this, if, if Shane just has Sphinx's Revelation, uh, this might be enough of a board presence where Shane could actually leverage that into enough yeah, damage. Yeah, I was gonna say that actually could get there. He does have another Dissolve, though, which is gonna make Shane's mission all that much harder. Draw was Supreme Verdict for Alan Pennington. Remaining hand is Is It Charm and Supreme Verdict. Yeah, so now Alan looks like he's in a pretty commanding position. Yep, he's gonna rev for three main phase. Doing it main phase because there's no real reason not to, and also he doesn't have a land for the turn. Yeah, I think mostly it was just he wanted to hit his land drop and knew he wasn't really gonna be doing anything else. And plays, does find his land, it's a temple, plays it, scries to the bottom and passes back. And Shane draws another island. He has Cyclonic Rift. Um, and he's going to go ahead and hit for full four, knocking Alan down to 10. Rift is actually one of the ways I have stolen game, I've seen game, had game one stolen from me by Mono Blue. Like, say all my early removal was Detention Spheres. Sometimes yep. they just end step Rift. Like, if you have the wrong things under those spheres, if, sometimes they can end step Rift all your spheres and just kill you. Yeah. Um, Get back a Thassa and a Master of Waves and then untap play some other things. Yeah, I mean, they, they can Rift and like untap with 12 power or something. Uh, but there were no spheres on Alan's side. And now he's going to go ahead and make Aetherling with blue up, and this should just be good enough. It generally is. Yeah, and know? It, it's harder. So, like, the game one is tough enough. Even if the blue-white control deck didn't have Sphinx's Revelation in it, I'm st I still think it would be a favorite game one. Just, just off, like, Divinations and Azorius Charms. To me, it's like, even that feels like it would be enough to make this a good matchup game one. Yeah, I mean, I think the blue-white decks need something like Sphinx's Revelation against the red base decks, just because it's like stream of life. You yeah. know, it just gains you a bunch of life, which is what you need. Whereas against this mono blue deck, it kind of helps, but it's also kind of a liability against things like Judge's Familiar, where you might not get to cast Revelation for a lot, and in the meantime, it kind of just like clogs up your hand. So uh, instead of Revelation, you might just be better off just jamming things like Elspeth and Aetherling in this matchup. Yeah, he's going to go ahead and swing in with the Aetherling, and now the clock starts going his way. It's didn't even make it, doesn't make it unblockable, just swings a 4-5, a blinks it out, and we see this should be good enough. A Supreme Verdict is going to be cast by Alan, and in his hand there's another Sphinx's Revelation, and Shane should not be able to come back from that one. Yeah, almost certainly not, especially after drawing another land. Yeah. He does have the seventh land. He can now overload Cyclonic Rift. But yeah. Blue-white control decks don't typically play many permanents. No, they play Detention Sphere and maybe a Planeswalker. Alan plays two Planeswalkers. He plays two Gabbies of Elspeth. Well, five. He plays three Jaces and two Elspeths. But the Jaces, you don't really want to bounce anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think at this point, if you're Alan, you can, you can either keep jamming things or you could just sit back with all your mana untapped and it doesn't really matter what you do exactly. And this is a one of Karanos, God of the Storms, that Alan's going to play here. And yeah, it, it really mute about the draw from Shane and more of a formality here. Um, so one of the things I want to talk to you about is, and this is why I said I really liked this matchup, is it has to do with the sideboard. And the sideboard, like, start with mono blue sideboard, because this is where I think it becomes interesting. Mono blue almost has a transformational sideboard here, as it changes yeah. its game plan. So main deck, uh, the mono blue devotion deck doesn't have a lot of like fish elements, it doesn't have any counter spells, but in the sideboard he has two negates, three dissolves, one domestication, two dispel, two gainsay, two aetherling, one biden of thassa, two jace architect of thought. So it looks like a lot of cards geared specifically for this matchup. Yeah, so what's really interesting is is blue changes strategies. Instead of becoming an aggro deck, it generally boards out its master of waves. It boards out a lot of its like domestications and cyclonic rifts, and then it becomes this deck where they try to play one threat and just hit you with it and then protect it with counter spells. And if you kill the threat, 
Like, what it's hoping to do is make the blue-white player tap out on his turn to remove the threat, and when they tap out, they simply replace it. They play another one, yeah. and they go back to work. Like, even something like Frostburn Weird can be a big threat because it's four damage a turn, and they just aren't going to do anything. Yeah. Uh, and then I think at that point, they're just trying to counter, like, Sphinx's Revelation and Elspeth, just, like, whatever the big cards are in that matchup. Yeah, and so they have Negates for Elspeth. They have Dissolves and Gainsays for Sphinx's Revelation. Um, by and large, like as a blue-white red control, as a blue-white control player, like Revelation stops being a very good card. It's very difficult post board to ever resolve a worthwhile Revelation. Yeah, I mean Revelation is is there uh, to f like be kind of like this thing that you use to fight on your opponent's turn, which I think is kind of useful. Where like if Shane is sitting on a creature and a counter spell, if you Revelate at the end of their turn, they're basically forced to countering it because that. Right. removes a lot of your clock and it allows them to make all their land drops and like play around your counter spells easily by playing more than one spell per turn or just like you know finding additional counter spells uh so in that sense it is kind of important but i wouldn't ever bank on it resolving you know you, exactly yeah you just use it as like uh you know a rev for three where let's just like please counter this because i really want to play this elspeth or this aetherling or whatever yeah, so, so there's some interesting elements. From the control side, right, you, do, you have to try to play blue-white control without revelations. You know, you, sh you can use them, but you have to assume they don't resolve. Um, or you certainly, you know, th they can't be the cornerstone to your game plan. So then it becomes like, what do you do in this matchup? It's like, when things are going the mono-blue player's way is, if they get a Thassa down, that's like, the, the, that, that's the thing you want to avoid having happen. Is, because then what will happen is the mono-blue player will just sit there behind Thassa, slowly outdrawing you and like playing threats until eventually you can't answer one and then they'll kill you with it. Yeah, um, yeah. and then even if, if you do Supreme Verdict them, they have this thing that can potentially just be turned on on their turn, so it's like, kind of gives them like this haste threat post Supreme Verdict, which is which can also be very important. Yeah, Biden to Thassa is actually very similar to Thassa in that way, is that yeah. it allows them to sit behind that. Um, looking at the sideboard for Alan, he has a couple of things he can do here. He can board, he has two Brahmas, King of Oreskos in his sideboard, which probably comes in here because it's it's a proactive way to like brick wall the, like Blue will try to do this thing where it plays like Thassa and a Frostburn Weird and just like fours you, fours you, fours you, and then makes you do something. So like Brahmas is something you can tap out for that continually answers their threats. It's pretty hard for Blue White to deal with. Like they don't really want to leave in their their domestications or anything. So that's a card I'm not opposed to in this matchup. Uh, Deicide is obviously very good in the matchup. It's your best answer to Thassa and Biden. Um, outside of that, I think there's a lot of different opinions on how to board this matchup. Um, yeah, I mean, like in theory, something like Anger of the Gods could be good because you're assuming that like this mono blue deck is uh, very much a go wide strategy where they're trying to play out a bunch of little creatures. But uh, you, by, by this point in the format, I would hope that uh, these players have a pretty good understanding of the matchup and like, Alan will realize that Shane is probably going to not really implement his game one strategy in game two and game three. He's going to just, you know, do what you said, where he just plays one creature and tries to protect it. So something like Anger is almost certainly just going to be a one-for-one, one, whereas something like uh, Brimaz, I think, is really good against the post-board strategy that Shane is going to try and play. So if I were game one and... and or if I was in game one in Alan's spot, I would probably not want Brimaz in my deck against Mono Blue Devotion, just because right. they have so many ways to go over the top of it. But post board, at the very least, if you're sitting on a Frostburn Weird and a counter spell, I want Brimaz because it's a very cheap threat that can potentially brick wall you. And it is a card that you basically have to counter for three mana. And I don't think that the blue deck is going to keep in any of the Cyclonic Rifts, Domestications, or Rapids. Right. I mean, they could just next level you and keep in a Domestication. They actually very likely keep in Rapids in this matchup if they're up to date on the if they know the format, because one of the things that blue-white control has done to combat mono blue is they play a lot of Archangel of Thune out of the sideboard. That card's like pretty tailor-made. Like it's a house against mono blue. You know, it, they... it is certainly, but if if normal blue-white does that, I'm not sure if blue-white red will do that. You know, like they almost certainly have different game plans for for what's going on, and I just wouldn't expect them to implement the same type of thing. And yeah. You know, there's that argument where, like, okay, you're down a game. Does that mean that you hedge more, or does that mean that uh, you have to just kind of go, like, all so, out, and if they have it, they have it? What I would do, and what I've seen, like, my opinion on Mono Blue is here is that you board in the Rapids, at least for game two, you, you keep your Rapids in, because if they have Archangel, you're going to need them. And if they don't, you can probably still get value by when they, going, when they go for a kill spell on one of your creatures, you can Rapid your own guy, which is 
more or less makes Rapid another threat. Yeah, it's not a great threat. It's like contingent on some things, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it not works too against, bad. It works against some stuff, doesn't work against Supreme Verdict, which is ultimately the problem. Yeah, but Verdict isn't so much what you're worried. Like, if you're only going to play one creature, like, Verdict is okay. Sure. Uh, like, Azorius Charm, Last Breath, you can, you can hit those things. Um, where I've seen difference of opinion is whether or not a blue-white player wants to keep all his counter spells in in this matchup. Like, mm -hmm. when you're playing control against aggro control or tempo, usually the control decks counter spells tend to be pretty mediocre. Yeah, I agree with that. But again, it is very much a case of whether or not Alan understands that game one and game two are very different things. Exactly. You know, you want a sideboard against their sideboard, not necessarily against their game one deck, because after game one, their deck is completely different. And there's a danger. If you boarded all your counter spells, there's a chance your mono blue devotion opponent will just cast Aetherling. Yeah. And then you're just like, well, uh, what do I do uh, now? I, I yeah. board out my counter spells. Yeah, it resolves. Oh, this is bad. So Shane on the mulligan, he does play three islands, and thanks to a turn two temple from Alan, this Thassa he played on turn three is going to resolve. Yeah. And then barring any detention spheres or deicides, this thing is going to do a lot of work. You know, he's not off to a very aggressive start, but I don't think he really minds, especially since he's sitting on a bunch of counter spells and has a lot of time to sculpt his draws now with Thassa. Yeah, Alan's third land is Sacred Foundry. Is he going to get the Thassa? The answer is no. He did not have the Detention Sphere or DSI'd. So Shane's going to work like with what I would assume was his game plan, sit and play with one creature and a Thassa, and beat Alan up with the creature until he does something about it. Yeah. And now it looks like since Alan played his land untapped, either it means he has a white spell because that's his first white land, or he has a dissolve. So I totally understand Shane not wanting to just like jam his Jace into open counter spell mana, even if there's not really anything that he would want to counter from Alan's side on the next turn. I like how Shane is playing this. I think this is exact. This is exactly how the mono blue deck wants to play it. Yep. If I'm the blue white deck, I'm a little. I'm worried about this game state actually because I'm not convinced that things are getting better for me if we right. just sit around drawing cards. And you see Shane waiting until five mana, then goes for Nightvale Spectre. He does have both Negate and Gainsay up here. And Counterflux is a play from Alan, and we can't really do much about that one. Yeah, you can, but I That's I don't... Yeah, I feel like, you know, you're trying to counter, like, what the, the blue-white-red's big threats are. Yep. And you're not too worried about them using counter spells to stop your little threats. Shane swings in with Muto out for two and passes back. This is actually going to give Alan an opening. If Alan has Jace Architect of Thought, he's going to get a rare chance to resolve it right now. I'm not... It's interesting. So Shane had to make a decision with whether or not two damage was worth this opportunity. Yeah, but also, is, is Jace a threat? I mean, sure, Alan could tick up Jace. Then you could play your own. Uh, if he ticks down, sure, he gets to draw some cards, but you can hit it with Mutavault. Yeah. So is, is Jace a big deal? I'm not sure. I think when you hit it on the head when you said, if he plays Jace, then Shane gets his own Jace back. Mm -hmm. And I think a, Shane on, a Jace on Shane's side is just as good as the Jace on Alan's side. Yeah. So as we see, Alan is going to take the opportunity to play Architect of Thought. He pluses it. And yeah, this should be fine, because Shane's going to get his own Jace now. You see, he scries and decides to keep an island. Yeah, keeps the, keeps the land, not because you really want six lands in this matchup. Like, Shane is definitely building up to one of his two sideboard Aetherlings, but he just wants to be able to play a threat with Counterspell mana open. You see, Shane, he gets to go differently here. He's going to minus the Jace. He finds three lands, a Mutavault and two islands. Glad to get those off the top of his deck. He decides to keep the Mutavault. Because his opponent's blue, white, red, what do you think are the odds that he just has a burn spell for Jace? Uh, a possibility is certainly there. And I think if Alan just untaps and fires off a burn spell at you, presumably going to redirect it to Jace, you just let it happen. And, you know, you traded it for a burn spell and a Muta Vault, and I think that's fine. We see Alan untaps. He has five lands and a Jace. But like I said, these post-board games, like, I have found them fun enough to, like, I could play this post, like, I would just sit down and play this post board matchup for, for fun sure. from either side, because I just think it's, it's really skill testing and it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that's been one of the things holding Mono Blue back has been this matchup. It has just been very, very difficult to beat consistently. Well, well I wonder what's going to get two temples. <laughs> wonder what that split's going to be. <laughs> Three Temple of Enlightenments for Alan. So he minus his own Jace. There's like a bunch of valuing, right? On Shane's side, it's like, well, if he gets a Jace and I get a Jace, is this an in, like, is this a trade I'm okay with? I'm like, I think Shane's playing it very well right now, actually. Yeah, me too. He's he's showing uh, a lot of patience, and it seems like he has played this matchup before. He knows what's important. Yeah, D aside is a bit of a concern for the mono blue deck. It's like when that that card's printing has hurt the mono blue side of this matchup. Yeah, that's certainly true. Also, 
Jace is going to plus here. The draw for the turn was Night Veil vale Spectre. Second Mute of Alt down. And now the protect the queen strategy. One, one creature, go. It's being used here by Shane as he plays Night Veil vale Spectre. And yeah, that was actually enough to activate Fossa. Yeah. And, and still has these two counter spells, has been just holding on to them, just like gripping them for dear life. Yeah. Waiting for Alan to play something of relevance. Well, that's the annoying part when you're blue-white, right? They just always have this stupid handful of two-mana hard counters for your whole deck. Yeah. It just feels terrible. And here, Last Breath is going to come on Nightfall Spectre, and Shane's going to push the issue a little bit. He's going to go for a negate on Last Breath. Yeah, and I don't mind this. Uh, he still has a gainsay left over for any Sphinx's revelations, and it really forces Alan to have an answer, because even if he does uh, get rid of the Nightfall Spectre, Shane can still untap, use Jace, maybe find another blue card. He still has two Muta Vaults, and getting in that five points of damage might be a really big deal, actually. Yeah, I like it because, okay, if he plays Aetherling or Rev, you have the Counterspell. You wouldn't have a Counterspell if he played Elspeth, but thanks to your active Thassa, you actually still have the Elspeth covered as well. Right. So there's nothing, there's like no spell that Blue-Eye Red Control could resolve here that's particularly problematic. Like, yeah, you've given him a window to try to fight through Gainsay, but I'm not sure what he'll do with it. Maybe he'll cast Supreme Verdict, which is fine. You have Jace and Thassa in play. Yeah. And, and some Muta Vaults. And then you can just take down Jace, maybe maybe find another source of devotion. Yeah. Or just attack with some Muta Vaults. Four damage is actually, like, plenty right now. Maybe you take down Jace and find a Bident, and you, like, hit him with, like, Bident plus Muta Vaults. Yeah. just terrifying from the blue-white side. Yep. Yeah. And to be fair, I don't think Alan is playing this poorly either. I think... No. I actually think when the mono blue player is very seasoned in this matchup, I think it is the mono blue player is favored post board. Yeah. It's just whether or not they can win both of those post board games because they almost certainly lose game one. Game one is right. So it's like if you're 20% to win game one and 60 to win games two and three, you're still a, an underdog to win the match. Right. So the split was Thassa with Night Vale and Biden. Shane's just going to go straight for the Biden there. And that's really no surprise. Biden is definitely one of the most powerful cards in this matchup. Like, I feel like if, you know, Shane's already in a very good spot, but if he gets to connect something with a Biden in play this turn, uh, he's just going to run away with the game. Yeah, so he plays Biden. This, this is a complete counter spell check on Allen. And the thing is, even if Allen has the counter spell, and this is why I like the mono blue strategy, like, okay, right? That's fine. Uh, if he has a mono blue. If, if he has the counter for the Biden, because then Shane gets to hit him with a Night Veil and with a Thassa and deal seven, and things are great. And as it turns out, he doesn't have the counter spell. So now with Biden in play, Thassa and Night Veil and Mutavolt are entering the red zone. And Alan's reaching for his life pad. That's not good news at all for him. Yeah, that's not a good sign. I'm really not sure what he can do at this point to get back into the game. He's going to take nine, go to seven. Shane's going to chop a card off the top of his deck and then draw three cards. Um, that's a yeah. good turn for Shane. Mm, yeah, that's... And this is, this is how you get bowled over here is the blue-white-red control deck by the mono blue deck. You see, Judge is familiar. Jace and Island were the three extra draws. Still has that gainsay. So Supreme Verdict, which used to be the best card in the matchup, in game one at least. Now what happens if Alan casts it? It kills Nightfail Spectre. Thos is still alive. Shane still has a bunch of Muta Vaults, an active Jace, a Bident. Yeah. Alan hits the panic button on end step there. He goes for a Sphinx's Revelation. It gets the gainsay out of Shane's hand. And to be honest, even if the, the revelation resolved there, like, I don't think know if Alan's out of this. Yeah, I still like my spot if I'm Shane. It's just at that point, it's like, I'll stop you from gaining three life. Yeah. Because I, I think he has most everything else covered. And you still gainsay the revelation, because if you're not gainsaying revelation, what are you gainsaying at this point? Maybe but, detention sphere, but that's about it. Right. And if your plan is to gainsay detention sphere, it's probably best to still, like, hit the revelation. Yeah. See, Supreme Verdict cast. It gets one creature. And Shane has a full five devotion in non-creature permanence here. And Aetherling was the draw. If, right now, the, he has a lethal swing, so Alan's going to have to tap out to stop the lethal swing. And if Alan does, then Aetherling will be made. Yeah. So he really has Alan caught between a rock and a hard place. Should be able to get it on this turn or in the next. So this is like the kind of blue attacking deck that I could get into is when I watch games like yeah. this play, then I'm like, all right, you know, yeah, there's a lot of creatures and yeah, that sucks, but I could, I could do this. This is okay. Look, he's drawn a lot of cards. He's playing some counter spells. This is, this is neat. 
and swings for nine, and that'll do it. So at one game apiece, Shane evens the score with Alan Pennington. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, how do you feel about the Aetherlings on the sideboard specifically? Because I know, you know, that was the, the plan against control for basically week one of that deck existing at Pro Tour Theros, where some of the teams had one or two Aetherlings on the board. But you don't see it too much nowadays, and it seems like Shane is just very committed to building up to that. Um, so, I, like I said, I, as the blue-white-red control player, typically want to board out my counter spells in this matchup. Uh, the problem I have is, like, when my opponent gets a turn three Thassa down, the dissolves in my hand never do anything. Right. Because, like, he'll play a Thassa and a Mutavault, and then I'll just, like, never do anything. So I can't counter a, a thing. And then, finally, I have to tap out to do something. When I do, he counters it, or he plays it. Like, when he plays his next threat, I don't have counter magic down because I just tapped out. So, like, yeah. I find my counter spells to be, like, only good when I'm winning. So, normally, I want to board out my counter spells, except when my opponent has Aetherlings. I can't honestly do that because if I do that and I board out of my counter spells, say I get control of the game. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I got my verdict. I, I sphered your Thassa. I'm off to the, I, I revved for three. I'm off to the races, right? And then you just go, like, land eight Aetherling. Yeah. And I was like, well, that resolves, unfortunately. I'm like, wait. I'm gonna lose the game now, and <laughs> and I and I don't want to. If I were like, I don't want to lose games from that board state. Yeah, I I definitely feel you there. But do you feel like that that is a thing that mono blue players should be employing? Interesting. So I just like I've just I've only started playing mono blue like at one tournament or something. So if they only use the card for this matchup, I would say probably not because I think you you could use your sideboard better. Uh, when I played the deck, I did not have Aetherlings in my sideboard. Yeah, and that's fair. I just feel like so much of your sideboard is already devoted to beating blue-white, and if without Aetherling, your post board is still like 50-50, and you know, you're know you spending all these spots. Probably still better than 50-50, even without him. Okay. So yeah, that, that's what I was going to get. It's like, you know, how, how many percentage points does Aetherling actually give you, and is that worth the two sideboard slots? Because you're already pretty low on sideboard slots. Like, I think he'd, he'd have to really change the matchup, and I'm not sure he does that. Like, I would personally, you know, th th there's other things I think that you could have in your sideboard that aren't bad. Um, like, he could have a second, like, if I want a card for control, he could have a second Bident. Yeah. I, I might be happier with that. Because um, I'd also use that against Mono Black, right? Yep. So, yeah, yeah, that's fair. And I don't know, maybe he uses the Aetherlings against Mono Black. My suspicion is he doesn't. I don't think so. I think that matchup, you're just trying to tempo them out. Yeah. Well, the problem is in that matchup, like, they, they, can, they pack rat you, so, like, and you can't do much about pack rats. Yeah. So if, you draw, if they pack rat you and you have an Aetherling in your hand, you, you feel pretty miserable about what you've done with your sideboard. Yeah, this blue-white deck doesn't really put you under a lot of pressure, so you have enough time to build up to Aetherling, whereas I don't think that's the case against the Black Devotion decks. I mean, you're playing an Aetherling in what, in a 25-land deck with no card draw? Like, well, you have Biden and Jace. Yeah, but if those are already happening, like, you're probably already winning. What I'm saying is, you know, it, it's like a pretty aggressive play to be putting that guy in this deck. Sure. And, and that's kind of what I was wondering, was, like, if you have a Jace or you have a Biden, something that could potentially make it so you can get to seven lands pretty reasonably, uh, is that enough? Or, like, are you, if you're stuck, like, scrying with Thassa to try and get enough lands to play Aetherling, that doesn't seem like where I you want to be. I've had games where they've drawn their one of Nykthos and Nykthos into an early Aetherling, and that was just backbreaking. Yeah, that's reasonable. All right, game three, we are underway. Alan Pennington on the play, starts off on a temple. The turn one play from Shane is a Mutavault. Alan looks like he's getting his tap lands out of the way. Can Shane get a creature down? He's just going to swing Mutavault in. Uh, it's pretty interesting that he has two judges familiars and is electing to just start swinging with Mutavault. Yeah, he also still looks like he has Master of Waves left in his, in his hand as well. And that's a card that I usually don't see post board in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of stuff to bring in, so you're going to side out a lot of the things that make Master of Waves actually good. So in that sense, it does make sense to at least trim them. But Master is like the Rabble Master, I think, where it is the threat that you want post-verdict, or it is one of the threats. I think uh, you know something like Biden or Jace is probably more powerful just because it has a bigger impact on the game. But it might be that thing where it's like, I'm not going to give you a bunch of turns. And I like what Shane did here. He he played a Judge Smelier before playing his land to bait out a Dissolve. And he went ahead and did that. Plays a second Mutavault and hits for two. Yeah, I think, like, the reason Master Spans come out, and I know that they can come out against Mono Black, too, is that, like, if it's just going to eat a kill spell, what does, like, what does the card matter, right? It's yeah. just another creature. You'd rather have your creature cost two instead of four. And Alan misses his fourth land drop, and here comes an opening for Shane. He's going to swing for two, four more with Mutavaults. 
And, and this is pretty interesting, right? So Shane's hand, like he did draw a Biden that turn, and that's very strong, but it doesn't have much going on in it. Yeah. Except he's got this just four damage stream from Mutavaults. And he opted to swing, he's swinging two Mutavaults when he could be casting Biden. And I like that. He's <laughs> looks like he's going to wait until there's, he's going to force Alan to tap out to do something, and then he's going to yeah. go ahead and cast Biden. Yeah, I mean, it also lets you play around potential counter spells, which is nice. And you, you see there. Get in yeah. your damage while you can. and Two Judge Smealers have traded with two Dissolves. Yeah. And that's like that's what Mono Blue does to you when you're the control deck. They make you frig they make you dissolve their Judge's Familiars. Yeah. And you just you just hate yourself when it happens. Here we go. Alan did tap out, tap for Jace down to one mana, and now Shane will take the opportunity to cast Biden. And then it feels like you just attack Alan for one, draw a card, and yeah. now you have three Mutavaults against an opponent at five life. And you have a Biden, so all those Muta Vaults. You just ignore Jace, or you rift him, or... You know, you just ignore him. He doesn't have a counter spell in hand left. You see his remaining hand is Master, Cyclonic Rift, and three more islands. That's lands seven, eight, and nine. Aetherling is very castable this game, if yeah. it gets to that point. I mean, it's really impressive that Shane looks to be winning with a hand that I thought, like, by most measures was a pretty weak hand. Yeah, it was just, I mean, for the most part, he was just jamming with two Mutavaults, and Alan stumbled a little bit, and it looked like that's enough. I mean, sometimes you're just called the Mutavault. Yeah. You see a second Cyclonic Rift as the draw for Shane. So, if you're Shane, what do you think are the odds your opponent plays Quicken? That's what I'd be thinking right now. Yeah, that is a tough one, right? Because if he plays, if he Quicken Verdicts here, <laughs> Well, then, then you kind of lose. But if he doesn't, then you probably you can draw three cards. Right. All right. Izzet trying to take down one Muta Vault, but the other two hit it, and Alan's going to go to three. Shane's going to draw two. They are Thassa and Frostburn Weird. Great draws. He passes it back. Shane with a bevy of Sphinx's Revs. Uh, Alan, sorry, with a bevy of Sphinx's Revs. He might, he might be able to get out of this. It's possible. Like, Jace is certainly doing a lot of work. I feel like uh, six land for Elspeth was basically what he wanted that turn. Yeah, he's going to just rev for two here. Puts him back up to five. Might be too much of a risk to tick down that Jace and try and find the land in order to play Elspeth. Yeah, I don't know if he can... Right, because then, then if he doesn't find it, he's, he's done. And we see he's going to play a Temple of Epiphany, Scry. He did draw a Steam Vents there, so he does have a seventh land, but it does hurt himself. And Well, he's at five, so that's not great. And yet another island for Shane. But thanks to those Muta Vaults, he's got some cards to work with. We'll see how much he commits. Yeah, at this point, Shane has some dead cards, but I think he's seeing enough cards that it doesn't really matter. Like, we, we may even see him, like, go to his discard step on this turn. Yeah, he's gonna draw three each turn, and it's very reasonable that that would happen. He's gotta watch out, though, because he doesn't have counter spells yet, and Alan is getting into revelation territory, so things... Right. And that might be what he's trying to do now, rather than develop his board, he's just trying to crack in to try and find a counter spell. Exactly, he doesn't, he finds a Night Vale Spectre, and more importantly, he finds another Muta Vault. So he gets, plays the Muta Vault, and then plays Thassa for the turn. And then we go to the discard step. Island goes in the bin. <laughs> but three, he's back to having three Muta Vaults, which is just great for Shane. And so one thing I, I've seen in this matchup that I've wanted to, I, sometimes when I've had Pithing Needles in my sideboard in Blue White, I actually boarded them in, in this matchup just so I can needle Muta Vaults yeah. so that this kind of stuff doesn't happen. Because like this board state is actually very difficult for, for Blue White or Blue White Red to deal with. Because you just, like, you don't actually have that many cards that kill Muta Vaults. You have Azorius Charms, but those don't actually kill them. You have Izzet Charms, you have Last Breaths. And normally, like, if I'm playing it, I don't even have the Izzet Charms. I just have some Last Breaths. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think normally Alan wants to get to a position where uh, he can play Sphinx's Revelation for a large enough amount that the little damage from Mutavault doesn't actually do a whole lot. Uh, but he's not really in that spot because he missed a couple land drops early. Yeah. He plays a Temple and passes. Now... I'm going to weigh this against you. So this is, this is the first time where I've did, like wondered what, about Alan's play. So like, what are the, you think the benefits there to instead while your opponent's tapped out to detention sparing the Bident? 
Like, if your opponent's drawing three a turn and continually, I just don't ever see him winning. Yeah, but then what's your plan against the three Buta Vaults? We'll figure it out. Okay, sure. I mean, it's not good, but I'm still alive, kind of. And the problem here is now Shane goes into full aggro mode. He plays Prosper and Weird. That's enough to activate Thassa. And now just Thassa is going to swing. Shane's going to sit back on some counter spells and force Alan to have two answers. He has one gain sand hand, so Alan will need two Azorius charm style effects. He's going to go for Sphinx's Rev. That'll get gain saved. And the match goes to Shane Rommelt, moving up to 5-0. and those were some two really well-played games on Shane's side. And you made the comment, too, where it's like, it's not like Alan played bad. I think he played pretty well, too. But it was just yep. like Shane just did exactly what he had to do to put Alan in a bad spot and just rode that. Yeah. And even if you...